basically the theory is that by the age of around two or three, we develop an attachment system, which mm. will pretty much determine how we relate romantically as adults, depending on how safe and consistent and stable our primary caregiver. Mm. That creates an emotional bond where we can know if you're securely attached and you had a caregiver who was there for you, then you know intimacy is safe. I can trust this person. And when you grow up, that transfers onto your romantic partner and mm. you are able to move through fights. You don't put your entire identity or sense of self-worth on the person. And mm. that securely attached is where we want to strive to be. Hey, you're listening to Big Asian Energy Show, where every week we interview Asian experts, move makers, and ceiling break cover their secrets to success so we can help you reach your greatest potential. I'm your host, John Wang. Welcome back to the show. And today we are chatting with Amy Chan, to the breakup expert who has been called by Maria Carrier as being the scientific Carrie Bradshaw and has been on Good Morning America, New York Times, Vogue, and has led workshops from everyone from Google to Columbia University. On this episode, Amy shares about the science of getting over breakups and how the patterns of many Asian American experiences in childhood might affect their relationships differently from those from different backgrounds. We talked about things like attachment styles, the most common mistakes people make in their relationships that lead them to break up, and of course, how to mend from a broken heart. Once again, thank you so much, Amy, for taking the time to come and chat, especially about relationships, because I think this is something that so many of us are so curious about. It's like the one big thing in so many of our lives. But before we dive into that, can I just ask, for our guests who haven't really met you and your brilliant work yet, can you describe in your own words who you are and what you do? Yeah, so I study the psychology of interpersonal relationships, mm. and I've really built a niche around breakup. So I'm the founder of Renew Breakup Bootcamp. We take a scientific approach to healing the heart, and I wrote the book Breakup Bootcamp, The Science of Rewiring Your Heart. So everything I do is on the psychology, really practical research-backed tips on how mm. we can create healthier relationship patterns. That's a little bit about me. I've been called like the scientific version of Carrie Bradshaw which I think is a compliment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love it. From Sex and the City, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I used to love that show. Your book, of course, has made a splash. Is there anything else that along your journey that has been quite pivotal for you that has shown up? Yeah, I definitely didn't think I was going to be a breakup expert when I was young. And I definitely disappointed my parents who thought I was going to be a lawyer. <laughs> but the way it came about was I relationships was the one area I continued to struggle with since I was really young mm -hmm. and I couldn't understand it because I got good grades. I was able to get good jobs. And so I figured if I could understand and unpack the science behind it, then maybe I wouldn't struggle so much. And I started off as a relationship columnist for a Vancouver newspaper called the 24 hours. Ooh. And from there, I finally got in a relationship in my late twenties. And I thought I met the one and that relationship, relationship fell apart very abruptly one day and oh. I put so much of my identity in him and us and that future that was painted that without that I really fell apart and I struggled like it was real real bad and oh, no. when I finally emerged out of that I just asked myself I was like man, what happens to the people who don't have friends that will support them, who mm. don't have couches to sleep on because you don't have your own home anymore, who don't know what books to read, who don't have a therapist? What happens to them? Because I really struggled and I thought, I have to be the one who creates something where people can go after a breakup to heal. And mm. it's not just yoga. They are getting expert advice from psychologists, behavioral scientists, so that they can shift their pattern so they don't keep repeating the same thing. And mm. so that's how Breakup Bootcamp was born. So yeah, I would say that the thing that I thought was the worst thing that had happened to me ended up being the best thing that had happened to me. I love that. I want to hear especially about that first part a little bit more though, because it's not a traditional path for a lot of Asian Canadian, Asian American, yeah. <laughs> but I'm really curious. How did you get, decide to start doing that interpersonal research and start this career path? At first it was really just a personal interest and a passion. And I blogged about it and I was like one of the first like WordPress bloggers back in the day. And <laughs> I never knew what I was going to do with all of it. I just knew one day all of this body of work would turn into something. <laughs> Fast forward 15 years later, a lot of that content I used for my book. And I was working in New York as a chief marketing officer, a company called Spin. There are these 
ping pong clubs. And I started this company on the side. It was supposed to just be a passion project. I launched the first one. It got a lot of press. And then I had no choice but to launch another one because now I had all these inquiries. And Mm -hmm. then after like my second one, I recognized I'm like, I have something here. There's a lot of people interested. It's actually helpful. Mm -hmm. Retreats were really fulfilling. I was like, okay, I need to de-risk the leaving corporate and a steady paycheck to start this thing, which is just an idea. And Hmm. that's what I did. Wow. That must've been quite a leap to take a lot of courage out that. It was definitely really scary because I've been someone who had valued safety my Mm -hmm. whole, and it was, Mm -hmm. to be honest, like after a psychedelic therapy session that I (laughs) got the courage to resign. (laughs) I love it. I think this is the number one question that you probably get every single day. How do you get over a breakup? How do you get over that heartache? There's a model that I look at, which is that there's seven stages of Mm. healing after a breakup. And my podcast that I'm actually launching in September is going to break down each one of these stages. And I just want people to understand you can hop around the stages. There's nothing abnormal about that. Mm. And it is based off the stages of grief from Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who Mm. looked at people who were dying. But the very first stage is shock. And at this stage, you need to just allow yourself to feel. And I think for a lot of overachievers out there, the mistake Mm. they make is they try to dive into psychoanalyzing their ex and themselves. Mm. There is a time and place for that, but it's not in the beginning. And in the beginning stage, you're in shock, you're in denial. You just have to keep continuously processing Mm. and remind yourself this relationship is over. Because Mm. even if logically you know it's done, your body doesn't get the memo. So it's going to cause you to get into a very motivational state to reach out to your ex, to stalk their social media. (laughs) And that's probably one of the biggest things you don't do. Don't text them. Don't, yeah, don't text them. Don't look at their IG stories with your Finsta. Mm -hmm. All of that just strengthens the old neural pathways that are associated with your ex and it will prolong your process. So I think that's one of the big takeaways is the no contact rule. It actually makes sense Mm -hmm. on a biological level. And I think another thing that happens later on in the stages, which is like depression and anger is we can get really caught up in a story where we're the victim and we try to get people on our side that they're a narcissist or whatever it is. I'm sure you've had friends maybe who are like in it. (laughs) And then what happens is everyone's, yeah, what a jerk, what this? And it just doesn't help. And the emotional charge actually keeps you attach Mm -hmm. sometimes we hold on to the pain Mm -hmm. and the anger and the resentment because subconsciously it's the last part of the relationship that we've got left Mm -hmm. so being mindful of that as well I remember when I was going through breakups in the past, like that kind of heart rate, heartbreak moment. I definitely had those kind of times where I wanted to go through and check all the past messages and all that kind of stuff and relive that. And I've definitely felt that sense of victimization. Oh, yeah. like these are all the things that they've done wrong. What you're suggesting is that in those kind of contexts, I'm actually worsening my situation by strengthening that that neural pathway by repeating all the same thing. Yeah. And so sometimes we'll actually replay memories or even yeah. fights as our way to stay connected. Mm -hmm. And again, like when I say there's different stages, like understanding what your ex did wrong per se Mm -hmm. is one of the parts. Mm -hmm. When people are in a depressed state and there's a tendency to sometimes put their ex on a pedestal, like they're the one who got away. Mm -hmm. At that time, we almost have like selective amnesia of all the reasons why it didn't work out. Because Mm -hmm. the pain of missing withdrawal is so big that we're Mm -hmm. like, oh no, it's totally fine. (laughs) And so when I'm working with someone who's in that state, I actually have them really write a list of what were the things that didn't go well were they unavailable Mm. they stonewall and then they're like oh yeah there was this oh and that and this and it launches them out of depression and into an anger so when someone's in depression tapping into the anger and the injustice can launch them out of depression and it shows that energy is moving so again it different strategies are required for where you are in the healing cycle. Since this is big Asian energy, and we talk a lot about Asian American experiences, do you feel like Asian people, maybe culturally speaking or upbringing or whatever it is, maybe we just watch a lot more K-drama than others. Do we process breakups or relationships differently? You definitely see in the research, depending on your attachment style, that you would process it differently. And we can go Mm. into that as well. But I think in terms of Asians who identify with more collectivistic values, harmony, having faith, keep 
gatekeeping face oh. and <laughs> not ever we don't talk about it. Yeah. Don't be a squeaky wheel. There's all yeah. these things that can be beneficial in our culture, but can also wreak havoc in our relationships and mm. whether that's personal or professional. Mm. And I know just personally speaking as an Asian woman and learning a lot from my mother was these values of don't say anything mm. or just be really accommodating. Mm. And I've seen it just bleed into my relationships and I've had to actually rewire and mm. be like, wait a minute, where did I get this habit from? Is it serving mm. me now? It might've been a way of being that served me in the past as a survival mechanism, but really mm. what taking stock of what are the habits that we got from culture, from our parents, mm. society, and asking if they serve us today and what we need to shift them so that mm. we could be relating in a more healthy way. I think one of the things that you talked about in the collectivist culture context was, at least in my experience, I have, what I have seen, I have had friends who I didn't realize they had gone through a divorce mm. because they felt like they had to keep that internally to themselves. And I feel like I've seen this pattern in myself. I've seen this pattern in some friends is that we have a pattern in which we want to wait until we have it figured out to share. Mm -hmm. Now, does that impact our relationship and breakup journey as well? Yeah, definitely. I think you made a really good point. Like that whole, we want to figure it out first. And I think that does tie into the collectivistic values, which is always making sure that you can yeah. face, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, it's like, there's no problem here. It's a way of emotional suppression mm. and avoidance and minimizing. And I think one of the challenges of the collectivistic values is that it doesn't promote vulnerability mm. and being open with your humanness and the mm. flaws that we all have. And I think that if we don't, we can miss out on getting support. We can miss out on being able to process what's actually going on. And I think it gives puts a lot of pressure when you are suffering or having a hard time to have it all together or, ha or have all the answers when you need help. You need a friggin' village for this stuff. That's huge, right? Because to be seen even is part of the processing. Yeah. To be seen, to be heard, to go through and to be helped. Actually, I run an Asian men's group. And one of the things I commonly see is there's so much much pressure with guys to go, no, we have to have it all together. We're given very limited social context after a breakup where it's okay, you can go and drink with your friends, get plaster drunk, and then probably start going on Tinder within the next week. It feels like it elongates the process. It makes it more complicated. I know people who feel like they haven't recovered from breakup years later. Yeah. And so the research actually shows that generally speaking, men and women tend to react to breakups differently. And again, this isn't everyone, but sure. men sure. tend to avoid, distract, and minimize. And mm -hmm. what happens is they might in the beginning seem like they're over the breakup really fast, but it catches up to them later mm. in the form of regret or mm. baggage. And it actually takes them longer to get over the person. Mm. Whereas with women, there's more of a tendency to grieve it all extremely intensely from the beginning. And once they do that, all that stuff comes up, they're able to process, release, move through it. They're able to, once they move forward. That's pretty powerful. Thank you for sharing that. In your experience, I know that you run workshops and you do programs. Do you also do one-on-one -on -one training, coaching as well? Yeah, I do private mentorship and group mentorship. That's very powerful. So one of the things you mentioned earlier was the word patterns. And we understand these to be behavioral patterns or adaptive patterns that we go through. Is that right? Yeah, for sure. And how do these patterns play out? What are some of the common patterns that you tend to see in either relationships or the support and separation? Yeah, I think attachment styles, it has been studied and researched, and that's probably worth noting. So basically the theory is that by the age of around two or three, we develop an attachment system, which mm -hmm. will pretty much determine how we relate romantically as adults, depending on how safe and consistent and stable our primary caregiver, that mm -hmm. creates an emotional bond where we can know if you're securely attached and you had a caregiver who was there for you, then you know, oh, intimacy is safe. I can trust this person. And when you grow up, that transfers onto your romantic partner mm. and you are able to move through fights. You don't put your entire identity or sense of self-worth on the person. And mm. that securely attached is the where we want to strive to be. I then there's avoidantly attached, which usually veer up more men 
than female. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a lot from how we're socialized. Avoidantly yeah. attached have a fear of intimacy, taking away their autonomy or independence. Mm -hmm. And it often happens if you had a caregiver who was controlling or very mm -hmm. smothering or didn't meet your needs at all. So as a young baby, you learn that, oh, intimacy actually isn't safe. It's mm -hmm. going to either suffocate me or I know I can't count on it. So what's the point anyway? I might as well be so extremely independent that I don't need anyone. And yeah, the hard thing with people with avoidant attachment style, they don't ever think that there's a problem with yeah. themselves. <laughs> so they're less upgrade. likely, yeah. yeah, they're less likely to read the books or go to therapy for these things because they're like, oh, I just haven't met the one. And then third type, which is the one that handles breakups the hardest is anxiously attached. Sure. And there is a very subconscious fear of abandonment or rejection. Mm. And when they sense that there's disconnection, they will do what's called protest behavior. So that's mm. when they might punish. So it's, oh, you took five hours to text me back. Screw you. I'll take five days. <laughs> yeah. Or they'll call it crazy. I've been there. They're all hyper vigilant to any mm. cues that the connection might be in jeopardy. And again, whether you're avoidant or anxious because they tend to attract one another. The goal is to become more secure yourself. And it is a spectrum. So you can be securely attached, but then you lose your job and then the person that you love moves across the country and then your anxious attachment comes up. So it does fluctuate, but unless you're really doing the work on becoming more secure, it generally stays the same. That's important is doing the work. I remember something that I learned from my own therapist <laughs> was that to some degree, we're all what you're talking about. We're all, I feel like the word doomed isn't a right word here, but there's a part of us, there's a programming where we're going to replay some of the patterns from our own parents. That is interesting because when I look at, especially again, Asian cultures, relationship in Asian cultures oftentimes look very different in relationship in Western cultures. My parents didn't grow up saying, I love you to each other. There wasn't a lot, like they expressed love more through actions and sacrifice. And it was very much a partnership, but and food and food. Oh my gosh. Or clothing. You eat yet? Have you eaten yet? I'm sending some food your way. I'm like mom. I... Oh, man. <laughs> so I guess my question is you and I, we are in North America. We have different options for relationships. How do we going through this? How did you learn to model a more healthy dynamic? Of relationship, if I could use that word tentatively, right? Because different cultures. I think understanding this concept called attractions of deprivation, also known as repetition compulsion, has been helpful. And it explains how we are drawn to people who can wound us in a very familiar way to how we were wounded mm. as children. Mm. And our psyche subconsciously tries to recreate the scenario of the crime in an attempt to change its ending. So I had a father who was a an immigrant. He was in survival state. He had a shop in Chinatown and it was work. I never mm -hmm. got to see him. He wasn't there emotionally. He didn't tell me that he thought I was an amazing human, like none of that stuff. And he was very unavailable. So when I grew up, I started when I looked at the people I dated, I was like, oh, in my teens and 20s, I dated only <laughs> DJs and club owners. And then in my 30s, it was only like tech entrepreneurs. And I'm like, yeah. oh, there's no no pattern here. But if you look at the emotional experience, it was exactly right. the same. And that was right. one of anxiety, one of trying to prove my worth, mm. one of trying to get their attention and their love and to earn mm. it by being perfect. And it was exactly the same relationship dynamic and emotional experience I had with my father. Mm -hmm. I think really stepping back to look at what emotional experience is repeating is the very mm -hmm. first step to identifying the pattern. And then looking at where did this come up? Where mm -hmm. in my childhood did this come up? And where was it actually a survival or protective mechanism that served me in that time? And how mm -hmm. does it need to be updated now? And it's not an overnight thing. Mm -hmm. It is a constant journey. And mm -hmm. I think I still do it, right? Like even overgiving has been mm -hmm. something I've had to really work on throughout the years and being able to receive. Can so, you explain overgiving a little bit just for the audience? Yeah. So overgiving is just giving, giving, and then feeling resentful that you're not being appreciated for it or right. uh, people aren't balancing it out. And mm. on the outside, it could look very heroic, but when you yeah. look at the source of where it comes from, mm -hmm. it's actually not coming from a place of abundance. It's coming, mm -hmm. at least personally for me, mm -hmm. and when I work with a lot of clients, this whole tendency to overcome mm -hmm. from a place of not feeling 
enough. Mm-hmm. And so you feel that you need to give in mm-hmm. order to gain love or you give as a way of having control yeah. or you give as a way and not receive as a way to keep people at a distance because mm-hmm. to be relational requires a flow of giving and receiving. That's one of the patterns mm-hmm. I've had to learn how to break. <laughs> and that's a big one, especially given our cultural backgrounds, like self-sacrifice is always held as one of the highest values. And yeah. the idea is that if we keep giving a giving, mm-hmm then at some point, someone will recognize us. Someone will, will, will return that. On the guy side of things, we look at that as being give to get energy. Mm. It's the fixer energy. If I be the nicest guy you ever know and give you everything you need, then if you always need me, then it's okay if you don't want me. Oof. That one hits, right? Yeah, that mic lands. drop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this is super powerful. What about on the other side of things, which is before the breakups? One, in this day and age, I think dating has become very complicated back quote unquote back in my day right like when i was growing up there's a little bit more where like you'd meet people and you test things out you go on the date nowadays there's 12 different apps there's 32 different ai there's ai right? good god yeah how do you advise couples who are certain not couples but people coming out of breakup patterns to maybe shift their patterns in looking for the next relationship. I think if you actually want to create a healthy, committed partnership, Mm -hmm. you want to look at what you've been optimizing and if your dating strategy needs to be updated. It is very normal in your teens and your 20s to optimize for things like looks, adventure, Mm -hmm excitement yeah. right that person who's popular who can get you in the club who knows all the people who's charismatic you're like yeah. yes yeah and then when you hit another stage of life when you're like mm. i'm considering family i'm considering creating a partnership with someone that strategy often is outdated for the goal that you want the outcome that you mm. want but a lot of the times we use the same strategy yeah. so we are basing do we go on a second date or do we swipe on this person based mm. on these things that really don't matter? Mm. And that's looks, that's height, that's how much money they make, that's the type yeah. of jeans that they wear that only matter in the short term. But what happens is you adapt to it. So you could be dating someone who's 10 out of 10 out of hotness, maybe <laughs> in other areas are not a really healthy person for you. In around two years, you will adapt to that hotness. So you're not going to have that rush of dopamine and excitement because you scored 10 out of 10. You'll just go back to baseline. It's not going to carry the relationship. Mm. It might ignite it. It might ignite lust and attraction. So Mm -hmm. I think really being aware that this lust and this, oh my God, I want to rip your clothes off. It changes. And a healthy Mm -hmm. partnership goes through first what's called passionate romantic love that usually lasts between eight months to two years. Mm -hmm. And after that, it changes and evolves into companionate love. And Mm -hmm. it's a different host of chemicals that happen. It's less dopamine. It's more Mm -hmm. oxytocin. It's more bonding. Mm -hmm. It's more, I know I can rely on this person. There's this Mm -hmm. kind of familial stability. Mm -hmm. And people think that there's something wrong when that happens, when actually it's just a relationship maturing. Deep love that we go into after the honeymoon phase, so to speak, colloquially yeah. right yeah, yeah that's huge do you see any patterns with the people who come to find you like in terms of why they are going through a breakup even what was the reason of the breakup do you find that there are certain things that people mistakes let's say like common mistakes that people are making in the relationship that leads them to that point yeah i think one of the patterns is there's way too much priority on chemistry and chemistry really screws them over Interesting. and the person that you have 10 out of 10 chemistry with is usually that's a red flag versus a green light and people get that confused and i don't blame them we grew up yeah. watching fairy tales and sex in the city yeah, right? those dramatic and, like, moments. <laughs> and we think that it should be this intensity and intensity yeah. is usually your nervous system being activated and uh-huh. it could even be a trauma bond so sure. if you have a history of not having a very accurate what i call chemistry compass 10 out of 10 chemistry is not your person. It's maybe for a fling, but it's not your person for a partnership. So I think that's one of the things. Mm-hmm. And number two, I think not being clear on what your values are and your non-negotiables mm-hmm. and really just reacting to relationships. So mm-hmm. if someone is trying to court you or a, a relationship happens, instead of being intentional and mindful of it, you just mm-hmm. let it happen. Mm-hmm. And so when that happens, I think the problem happens 
that occurs is we get positivity bias, especially if we really want a relationship or we're mm -hmm. at a certain age, we will then ignore all of the other things. But mm -hmm. if you actually have a list of these are my guiding values, because mm -hmm. that's what matters in a long-term relationship. And yeah. these are the non-negotiables, your kill mm -hmm. list. Yeah. And if someone hits any of them, it's not a, it's not a, oh, but maybe in rational, mm -hmm. it's a no. And we let too many of the non-negotiables slide. And then my clients that get to this point where I don't know how I got here, there were red flags the entire time. What are some examples of non-negotiables that you oftentimes advise people to look for? I think it's different for everyone. So for example, for one person, it could be, you must be monogamous, but there's some people yeah. who are more open. So that's not yeah, right. Sure. I know like for me, hard drugs is a no, but psychedelics mm -hmm. is okay. But I think one of the things that would save a lot of heartache and suffering is putting, if you want a committed partnership, unavailability. So mm, someone who lives in another continent, continent and you don't <laughs> have the schedule or the money to be able to make a long distance relationship work, it's a no, they're physically unavailable to create the bonding required for a partnership. Mm. Emotionally unavailable. Their people are showing you all the time with their words, their actions, their non-action. Mm. So pay attention to those things. And I think don't be so quick to be like, oh my God, like this is the person. <laughs> there is a period of time where there's evaluation. Yeah. You're not just waiting to be chosen. Mm. Or the one who's deciding, do we have enough of a match values wise, life vision wise? Is there integrity? Mm -hmm. Have you seen how they treat the wait staff? Mm. And you won't know that right away because in the no. beginning, everyone has their representative for the first three months. That's great advice. Yeah, huge point. Can I ask, because we talked about this earlier, what does your parents think about your work? I don't even know. Like my parents are so <laughs> traditional Chinese. Yeah. They think it's great if I'm on television, but they don't understand if I'm on the New York Times. Like it's just, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. The stretch yeah. is such a range. That's so fun. Everything is, did you get paid? I didn't get paid to be on the New York Times. What? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> why? I'm like, okay, whatever. Because I feel like it's such a tough thing to explain. I, even the idea, some of these concepts we're talking about, they're mental health related concepts. They're not yeah. easily propagated in their generation. So I'm always so curious when people tell, especially ones were from more traditional families. What do your parents say? And my parents have largely just go, I don't know. He talks, <laughs> he gives speeches. <laughs> I'm like, that's fine. That'll work. <laughs> Thank you so much, Amy. I so appreciate your time. I want to, I usually like to end off on one question, which is always, do you have a golden rule in your life that you kind of practice? I would say one of my ways of doing life is mm -hmm. I'm very in tune on energy. Mm -hmm. And I use that as my guiding principle. So whether it's a new friend who be like, do I want to spend more time with this person to a project? Mm. I really look at what sparks energy and what zaps it. And mm. I use that as my first filter before I go mm. into the logical parts. Thank you so much. Yeah. That's such a great way to take a look at something. Amy, how do our listeners, regardless of whether they're going through breakups or just want to find out more about you, how do they reach you and your work? You can follow me on Instagram at Miss Amy Chan or my website's renewbreakupbootcamp.com. All right. So Amy, I understand that the best way to find you is on your Instagram and on your website. You have workshops, right? And courses. Yeah. So I, I have breakup bootcamp retreats and I do personal mentoring and coaching. Perfect. Thank you so much for your time today, Amy. You are Yay. so appreciated. And thank you. thank you for doing all the work that you do.